In the fall of 2002, a sniper came to Washington, D.C. If you were around, you might remember that. For many people across the nation, it was news and it was, you know, cable news. But for those of us who lived there, it was our lives. My child was in the first grade then, and the first killing took place halfway between our home and my child's school. And so every day as we drove to school, we passed a monument to the woman who had been waiting for a bus and killed there. The next killing took place miles away, but at a gas station where a good friend of mine always got her gas, a random customer getting gas. And so this pattern of random killing took over the city of Washington, D.C. and the surrounding suburbs, and all of the sports teams stopped. There were parks that were just completely empty. Kids were shuttled out of school under police escort into buses and cars. It was a hard couple of weeks. And during that time, we were told that the killers were probably white men in a white van. So we were told to look out for white men in a white van, which, you know, a lot of white men drive white vans because they're working vans. And so every day you would see dozens and dozens of white vans. I was very fatalistic about it. I figured if we were going to get killed, we were going to get killed and um, ended up getting a really good deal on a car uh, because no one would go to the car a lot. So, you know, that it was a hard time. Eventually, during that time, the killer revealed who he was through a series of notes, so we knew his name. And a woman said, that's my ex-husband, and he's doing all this to get back at me. At the time, I thought this was kind of a grandiose idea of hers, but it did turn out that he had been staking out her neighborhood quite a bit, and... They never knew what he really was doing, but I have since learned how many mass shootings involve a person who is enraged at either an ex-wife or girlfriend who has left. So many of the men have been in the military. That's one characteristic they share. But another is that it's tied up with some story of domestic abuse, either with a parent or a partner or former partner that they kill many, many people. And of course, we know that every day, partners and children are killed. Four children every day are killed by parents or authority figures. 70% of them are under the age of three. And as we let that sink in, how could people entrusted with the most vulnerable times in someone else's life betray them so completely. We have to ask ourselves, you know, Vaclav Havel says the fault line between good and evil runs through every human heart. And I think that's true. I also think it runs through every human relationship. So I've been thinking about intimacy and evil. You know, so much of the time we talk about systemic evil and oppression, and that's all very important to talk about. But so is evil as it takes place in our most intimate relationships. I was recently in Harry Potter world in Florida, and it occurred to me while going on rides and taking the Hogwarts Express and otherwise thoroughly enjoying myself, that one of the great things about that series, all of the human beings in that are complicated. We see every form of cruelty we possibly could between family members and spouses, as well as between, you know, the Death Eaters and Voldemort and and, and the upstanding, you know, people. But But we also see a lot of people We're not sure. They seemed like they were good, but now they seem bad. They seemed like they were bad, but now they seemed good. And there's a lot of complexity about the characters and who they are related to good and evil. And I think we recognize that because it's true. I think we know it first about ourselves. I wish I could say that I have never treated someone I love with disrespect or anger. I made a vow when I was a young kid. I had a dad who was 
angry and violent, and I made a vow to never, ever yell at my child if I had children. And as the lyrics go, though you've broken your vows a thousand times, come yet again, come, right? I wish I could say I never lost it, but I did. And the thing about losing it with someone that you love, I mean really losing it, not just kind of being irritated that they left the lid off the peanut butter, but really losing it, is I'll speak for myself. There are times when I have not only wanted somebody to stop doing what they were doing that I didn't like or that hurt me, I have wanted them to stop existing. I've not only wanted them to stop saying what they were saying that I didn't want to here. I've wanted them to not have that opinion. I've wanted them to, if they had to have that opinion, to not exist. They have felt life-threatening to me. And I mean, I'm thankful about the places I have not gone with my rage. I am very grateful. <laughs> and I have deep compassion for people who have gone to physical violence. Sadly, I understand it because of my own impulse. Here's what I can say as I speak honestly and with acknowledgement of how broken we all are, or most of us. If you're watching this and saying, oh my God, that's not me and that's horrible. I've never yelled at my child. I, I salute you. <laughs> but I've never met you, I'll tell you that. So... Here's the thing. First of all, compassion. To have compassion for yourself, yes, absolutely. Also to have compassion for the people that we hurt, right? And so to figure out how to make amends to them. Understanding that we can never fully amend the hurt that we do another, but we can do our best. One of the things that was most painful for me about my father is that he was quite cruel to all of us, especially my brother, and really seemed to die without ever regretting it, you know? And I thought, really? You get to just die and go on and that's that, you know? But I can express regret for the harm that I've done to people that I love. So that's one thing, is that we can really try to make amends, do the best that we can. There was a time when my kid was a teenager when if I would lose it and really just rage, um, I said, you know, that's soul damaging when I do that. And so we had a thing where I would repair the soles of my kids' shoes who gets, um, they get really nice shoes at thrift stores and sometimes they need to be resold. So there was a time when that's what I was doing was repairing soles on shoes for some soul repair for my anger. So that's one thing, is that we can have compassion and make amends. Another thing, though, I think is that we really need to get more help. For me, with my anger, I needed to recognize that actually the anger I felt as an adult was very tied to the helpless anger I felt as a kid. And I needed, for me, I needed a witness for that. I needed a therapist to really talk through and also to do some physical work of letting go of the trauma that came from that time so that it wasn't, you know, going to hair trigger and come back up when something felt similar to me. And so I think we really do need to get help. And I'm, I'm really excited about some of the things that they're figuring out about that with, you know, with all kinds of therapies that are cognitive therapies, but also body therapies and all kinds of treatment now for stored up anger and trauma. There are people who are dealing with this, you know, beyond here, take this drug and you'll feel better to really help you. And I encourage you to find somebody who can help you. Um, I hope that this community also by being a place of honesty and reality is helpful. And and I hope that you have friends who you can call when you say, oh my gosh, I suddenly don't think I should be alone with my kid because I'm so angry. Would you come over? You know, that that can help a lot just to have somebody come over and laugh with you or, or change the baby's diaper, whatever you need to get other adults nearby. I think that isolation can breed really bad treatment of one another and and the less isolated we are the better you can also just say if there aren't people nearby you can there are many places online where you can just go 
say, help, I need help, and get a little perspective. It's tough. I just want to be real that, you know, evil isn't just something that other bad people do. We are all complicit in all kinds of systems, not only of, you know, systemic oppression, but also of real mistreatment of one another. And so in these times, I think finding ways to treat each other better is something that we can do and we can help each other do. As we think about evil, I always think about, you know, and I've told the story before that I got a call to ministry working with abused kids. And that what I saw is kids again and again would turn towards love if it was offered. Even kids who had suffered horrific abuse would still turn towards love until the abuse was too repetitive and they simply couldn't believe the love anymore. But I think offering each other love, offering each other the best that we can be, is one thing that we can do to align ourselves with our universalist values. Intimate relationships, I think, are the testing ground for who we really are, not our public selves, not our carefully constructed selves that we present in social media, but how we treat those closest to us. I think, I think that's ultimately who we are and how we know the most. And so in your daily life, may you know love, may you create love, may you find help for the hard places, and may you always know that you are not alone.